Polly Russell, lead curator of Unfinished Business, the Fight for Women's Rights exhibition here at the British Library. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event. There are so many items in the Unfinished Business exhibition that speak to the huge sacrifice made by women in the past for the rights of women today. Perhaps one of the most haunting is the Holloway Prison toilet paper written upon by the imprisoned Sylvia Pankhurst. We are so lucky tonight to host Rachel Holmes, whose epic new biography of Sylvia Pankhurst was reviewed in the Times as follows. It's impossible to summarise adequately a book so magnificent. Rachel joins us in conversation with Shami Chakrabarti. Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the British Library, if only virtually. It's a huge privilege and a solace to be, to be with all you readers in these difficult times. Not unlike our subject this evening, Rachel Holmes is a writer and an activist. In addition to so much else, she's written four acclaimed biographies. One about the 19th century trans icon, Dr. James Barry. Then one about Sarah Bartman, otherwise known as the hot and top Venus. 2014, Eleanor Marks, A Life. And just this autumn, Sylvia Pankhurst, Natural Born Rebel. As we've heard, published to rave reviews, described by Lucy Davies in The Telegraph as stirring by Amanda Foreman in The Sunday Times as genius, and of course, by Gerard de Groot in The Times as magnificent. Rachel, congratulations. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for that generous welcome. And also in this, in this new way of doing things, um, just hello to all of the audience who, um, whose faces I can't see, but I'm uh, trying to visualize and, and, and imagine there. Well, look, we're obviously here to discuss the biography and its great subject, but I think also, quite rightly, to celebrate the British Library, um, where you made some important discoveries towards the project. Um, and as we've heard, the, the, the unfinished business exhibition in which Sylvia, the socialist, internationalist, anti-racist force of nature, um, features. Now, one of the images in the exhibition is of Sylvia holding her infant son, Richard, in, in probably about 1928, given, given his, his date of birth. Rachel, yours is a wonderful political biography, which is a rare thing um, in relation to a woman, let's be, let's be honest. And, and it's also almost a world history of the 20th century, that family matters and the Pankhurst family matters do feature a great deal with, with some importance, don't they? Well, I think that the, um, the Women's Social and Political Union, which was the, which was the, the sort of militant suffragette organisation that, 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 that the Pankhurst founded in conjunction uh, with, uh, with others from the Independent Labour Party of which they were part, and also trade union you know, garment workers, um, was was known as the family party, and that sort of gives you, you know, gives you gives you that link because everything. I mean, one of the fascinations about about them, and one of the things that's so interesting and instructive, is that uh, whilst they are very very tight knit, and and indeed in the early years all work very very closely together, the way they diverge in a in a if you like a sort of epic, as you say, family, but also political, uh, personal as political way, if you like, yeah. is that their schisms, their differences, their political differences really mirror and play out what the broader political differences are within the women's movement, but then within politics nationally, and you could even argue internationally. But uh, like, you know, like, as in most great family sagas, you know, there are three sisters and, and there's a very mercurial and, 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 and fascinating uh, and, and inspirational, but also complicated mother, who is, of course, Emmeline Pankhurst, Christabel Pankhurst, who's the lawyer, who's, the, who's Sylvia Pankhurst's elder sister, Sylvia 
the middle sister, and then the younger sister, Adela, and indeed the surviving for, for a while brother, Harry Pankhurst, who's, who was a really, really important suffragette activist in his own right before he sadly died when he was 20. And, and of course, you chose as the jumping off point for this big book about this even bigger life. You, you chose a, a, a really traumatic moment when Sylvia is 16. The book opens with her father dying and I think, you know, I, I, the, he, their, their feminism and indeed Emmeline Pankhurst's feminism and, and thus her daughter's is built on, on Richard Pankhurst, who was a, the father, who was a human rights lawyer. He drafted legislation with John Stuart Mill. Uh, he was an internationalist. He was a many, a many times failed parliamentary candidate and, and as everybody observed, far too radical and revolutionary to to ever get uh, to get elected at the time, but um, he was incredibly important in the formation of, of her politics and and, uh, and and psyche and consciousness, as as he was in, indeed to, to shaping Emmeline. But the book opens with his with his untimely and unexpected and, and shocking death when Sylvia was sixteen, which I think is a very very defining moment for her. The circumstances are very, very difficult for her. She's on her own because her mother and sister, her elder, her elder sister and her mother are away and she's unaware of, of the, the extremity of the situation her father's in. And as a consequence, I think she feels later of giving into authority when she asks for help. Uh, she, she listens to what people, whether it's, you know, whether it's the cook who's really in charge when her mother's away or whether it's, uh, whether it's the doctor, she, she believes them. And I think this actually strikes quite a defining moment for her in her relationship to authority. If you listen to what other people say unquestioningly, bad things will happen. And of course, subsequently, and, and in a way, tragically, uh, the family party splits. And this, this, this family, um, you know, without the red Dr. Pankhurst, um, splits. They they all started very firmly on the radical left, and then Emmeline, Mummy Emmeline, and older sister Christabel move more to the right. Um, and and this is quite a this is quite a painful schism in the family, but also arguably in feminism, even even to this day. Well, it again, it's it, it's absolutely part of the of the story. Of, of, of their personal lives and, and family, but it is also part of, of what happens in the broader movement, uh, which is, <clears throat> of course, what makes it what makes it relevant. And um, they, I think, it's important to to also focus on the fact that they work very successfully and for a very long time together, and that even though they had differences of approach and opinion, they held their unity publicly. And and when they began to diverge, <clears throat> Sylvia in particular, uh, and, and indeed Keir Hardy, who of course was, was very much uh, you know, a supporter and part of, of, of their movement, um, would argue internally, they would argue within the leadership as, and there were others as well over different positions, particularly over the participation of working women, the importance of focusing on, on, on the working women's vote on working class women and including them, Sylvia, um, and uh, Keir Hardy very much in favour of that. Over time, Christabel and Emily moved away from that position. And then also the change from the, the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, being a democratically run organisation to the decision again by Emmeline and, and Christabel to make it an autocracy, to make it an autocratic and undemocratic. And the differences that opened up over that were reflected elsewhere, but crucially the First World War. Mm. became the became the break the break point and Sylvia was a pacifist uh, anti-militarist and uh, uh, the of uh, Emmeline and and Christabel uh, were very bellicose they were they were very pro the war and that split uh, again played itself out more broadly within women uh, across different parts of the women's movement who particularly in the earlier stages of the war there was a lot more support for it as as things you know got harder over time, that retreated. But yes, in the end, of course, um, Emmeline, having started, you know, she she went to school in 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 Paris. Uh, she was very she was very much a francophile. She was very much uh, 
you know, very, very much part, and this kind of characterizes in her a way. She was very, very interested in the French Revolution, very much pro that kind of way of doing things. But eventually, she moves away from uh, from her from her earlier socialist position and ultimately stands as a as a conservative candidate in white and, and also spurns sylvia and and sylvia's son richard and 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 spurns sylvia's life choices in in in, in becoming a a single mother as in the photograph at the, at the age of 45 well she does and and that's uh, it's so it's so in, it, it's so interesting and in some ways incomprehensible because Emmeline is so fascinating and in many ways a very very sympathetic and obviously very inspiring person and character and her rejection of Sylvia for having a, 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 a child as was said in the language of the time out of wedlock um, I mean it was extraordinary Sylvia was 45 at the time that she had uh, her first and only child, Richard, with her partner and, and soulmate by then, Silvio Corio, who was a, an Italian anarchist, syndicalist, uh, political refugee, exile, which was probably Emmeline's problem. And he also had three other children with, with um, <clears throat> two other women. That was the way they rolled. But that that was not in keeping with how Emmeline had been when she was a younger woman. And in fact, one of the things that Sylvia records in her memoirs, as do other people about her, is that Emmeline's home was always a refuge for her women friends who were trying to escape um, abusive marriages they, or, or were having difficulties getting custody of, of, their, of being able to have access to their children because of being suffragettes or just, you know, generally she was she was not the sort of judgmental person in that way. So that rejection of Sylvia, which she never comes back from, is very, very hard. And she rejects Sylvia when she's pregnant, literally mm. on the doorstep of the house and then eventually, unfortunately, dies before. Um, and it's, it's incredibly poignant. It's incredibly poignant in, in the book, Rachel. And if I may say so, one of the great things about your wonderful book is we've got the winds of, of history and empire and world wars and great political figures but we've also got that that intimate life of, of, of so many people too um, and with that in mind um, again rather wonderfully um, the unfinished business exhibition also features one of Sylvia's paintings and of course you describe with you know, with some care, um, her first vocation as an artist. And had things been different, had her family been different, the times been different, she might well have been remembered today as a great art artist rather than, than, than a great activist. Um, do you but, want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, and she's, she's clearly that, that her, she's a very, very talented artist and she's, she's by temperament. Uh, as well as talent, uh, an artist. And she and gets she's... scholarships, doesn't she? She gets scholarships, which are extraordinary for a, a, a woman at that time. Yeah, she gets national scholarships. And as you say, unusual uh, for, for women, uh, for anybody at the time. And they were hard to get. First of the Manchester School of Art, wonderful radical art school, and then to the Royal College of Art in London. And, and having, been, the... having been clear, you write, you write a beautiful scene about her being convinced that she's She's done appallingly in the entrance exam. A completely young woman or any like woman imposter syndrome. So she's absolutely convinced that she's flunked uh, the, the entrance exam completely and sort of crawls back in through the window because everybody else is out and sort of lies and cries in bed and really thinks she's messes, messed it up, but of course hasn't. But she, she was immensely talented as an artist and, and this wonderful painting, I think it's the, the one in the Unfinished Business exhibition. Yeah is uh, of, of, a, of a woman chain, maker, chain maker in Cradley, yeah, in Cradley yeah. Heath in Staffordshire. 1907-1908, funded by Emmeline Pethick Lawrence. Of course, Emmeline and Fred Pethick Lawrence, very important characters as well um, in, in this history and story. And they fund her to go on this, if you like, artistic pilgrimage round the sort of industrial heartlands of England and Scotland. And Sylvia goes and she, you know, she boards with the women in whose factories and potteries and shoe factories and so on. She's actually painting and sketching and documenting. So she sort of beds, she's embedded, if you like to put it that way, she beds in. But as well as painting these, ex these extraordinary paintings and, uh, and sketches and doing the visual capture, if you like, and, and visual descriptions, she also 
documents in great detail with an economist mind exactly what the work conditions are, what the salaries are, the, the, the women are being paid, what their lives are like and their leisure and so on. And she, it, it's a really, on its own, that would have been, a, a, and it's, all, it's unprecedented for a woman artist, a, a, a British woman artist to do that. And very excitingly, in fact, the, the Tate, uh, the, the Tate last year, well, I say last year, time has gone a bit peculiar, hasn't it? <laughs> We've um, fallen off the it, Gregorian calendar, but yeah. It was either last year or the year before. Year before. Um, uh, the, the pre PC, the pre-COVID uh, calendar, uh, acquired four paintings yeah. from this, mag from, which are absolutely magnificent and, and will be on, on public display. But that was extraordinary work. But what she did was that because she had to pursue the, the, the politics of the day, uh, there was no choice. I mean, that you know, the rights had to be fought for. What she did was 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 transmute that that artistic talent immensely creatively into turning it to to the suffragette campaign. And she and she used her artistic talents to design um, d design uh, the iconography of the campaign and medals for. Um, hunger strike as you'd been in prison and tea sets in the days before t-shirts and what? so on and so forth yeah very much the t-shirt before the t-shirt and she had this she had this sort of Blakeian um she's actually a bit quite very much like Blake but she has this uh, talent and, and interest in great big uh in installations in, in public art. experiences public art yeah. and so she does those sort of, sort of w wonderful women's festivals uh, that, uh, that that but as well as that it's the it's the it's the creative and aesthetic look of those great rallies and I think it's hard to mm. to um, to imagine but but some of the photography does deliver it to us those wonderful Christina Broom uh, photographs that were, were discovered and displayed by the Museum of London a, a few years ago but the the pageantry, the way that the, the the suffragettes were able to capture the visual imagination, and so mm. whether it was you know Sylvia's liberty caps or or whether it was you know the paintings on the banners, uh, you mentioned the portcullis and arrow uh, motif, which was the brooch, which also became the medal of honour uh, for the hunger strikers, the suffragette hunger strikers, but also from on the grand scale, but also on the smaller scale, the decoration of, of, of teacups or, or tea services and things that, that would uh, capture people's engagement with it. So I think she had this in, immense capacity for first of all, bringing creativity and an aesthetic pleasure and engagement that, that, that captured the imagination. I mean, these, these rallies were the biggest national, and when I say national, I don't just mean, you know, like across the whole of Britain, uh, 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 rallies and and organized yeah. movements that have happened since the Chartists, but they were but they were they were colorful. They were they were themed. flamboyant. They were you know they were everything. They, you that... know the press. So it captured it captured the press imagination. It captured tension, yeah. and it also muddled with people's perceptions of what I mean in contemporary terms. You know what does a feminist look like? Um, you know the white dresses, um, the colors, and so on. And it also brought a sense of sort of. Joy. And there was a lot of imagination, whether it was, you know, hiring a, 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 a steamboat and, and, and going up the Thames and, and hollering at Westminster to, you know, to politicians on the terrace, or whether it was Muriel Matters, who was a friend of Sylvia's and, 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 and suffragette colleague in East London, who, who had a, who had a, a balloon and, and sort of bombed London uh, with 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 votes for women pamphlets. There was a lot so, of creativity and energy in this direct action. So she certainly brought her art to her activism, but her writing, her writing very much as well. And um, I've been thinking since reading the book a lot about the challenge and opportunity of writing about the life of such a prolific writer, which brings me back to the collection at the British Library and, and indeed to the toilet papers and to the treasure that you in particular um, unearthed with your meticulous transcribing of some of that, that you know, that very, very precious material. Yes, it's not I, just I, in a pandemic that loo paper is precious, people. <laughs> well, it, it's, a, I, I, it's a rather un inelegant coinage of mine the toilet papers but as that cash didn't as, as that part of it the the um the the um if you like package uh that that Richard Pankhurst had later 
uh, given to the British Library didn't, didn't the manuscripts didn't have any names. So for want of a better term, um, I call them the toilet papers. And it is wonderful. It's really, really terrific to see uh, that, that, that there is a, a, a piece of uh, His Majesty's, as it was at the time, standard issue um, government uh, Holloway prison toilet paper with a draft of one of Sylvia's poems alongside the frontispiece to Writ on Cold Slate, which was the collection of her prison poetry, which was published and in, in the 1921. Book, and in the book, Rachel, you describe how it's writ on cold slate, but it's only when you did the meticulous work in the British Library that you realise that it, it wasn't, of course, all written on cold slate. To um, at least to begin, it, it, you know, that was the conceit again. The great, the great, you know, PR campaigner. It's writ on cold slate, but a lot of very important work was written on this toilet paper and concealed and and got out of the prison, right? And, then, and also there's a sort of, there's a very sort of Sylvian um, espionage aspect to it as well, because I mean, that, that is a whole other aspect of her life in the twenties and thirties, once she got involved in, um, you know, in the Russian revolution and, and with the Bolsheviks and with Lenin and so on, uh, that, that was, there were a considerable period of her life from that time forward where she was in, by, of necessity, uh, involved in clandestine activities which had to be you know kept under the radar and hidden from the state she'd been under surveillance since she was a suffragette and that continued even more so in that in that title poem in writ on cold slate there's almost a there's a there's a sort of secret written into it and she says you know how can I how can I capture these lines that are just going to be washed away from this cold slate and of course she drafted ideas on her slate and chalk no doubt but uh but what this discovery reveals is that... Well, I'm going to stop you there because it's all in the book <laughs> and people really, really need to get this book. And in uncertain times with, um, you know, with, with, with some times to read, put it that way, ahead of us, this, this is the perfect, perfect Christmas present um, for, yeah. for any great readers um, in, in the family. But, but I want to just touch on... Um, you know, the great span of the life. We've talked a bit about the suffragette period. Of course, the, the, the writ on cold slate period is post-suffragette. This is when she's in prison for sedition. Um, as a newspaper so, editor. As a newspaper editor. Three you know. young male journalists, two white journalists and, and, and one black journalist, Claude Mackay, who in fact she... These days, newspaper, newspaper. newspaper people complain as Extinction Rebellion are like making noise outside their windows that <laughs> but, but but she actually went to she actually went to to prison for for journalistic freedom and uh, and so an extraordinary courage but she also took on and engaged with some of the great men the great historical men of of, of the 20th century churchill lenin highly selassie towards the end of her life i mean extraordinary Yes, it, it, the, the, those men, I suppose, or those those male political figures um, do actually sort of punctuate critically mm. some of, 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 of the issues and movements and campaigns that she was preoccupied with. And in fact, throughout her life, I mean, she she knew she first met Churchill rather disastrously, actually, because he 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 assaulted her on the stage, I'm afraid. Um, mm. When she was twenty, so he wasn't just. A, so this was. So Churchill is obviously very much on people's minds again because earlier, earlier this year, you know, protesters said he was a racist as part of Black Lives Matter and whatever. But he was also. He wasn't. You know, he was. He was prone to a little misogyny too, wasn't he? So he assaulted her when she, she heckled him at a meeting. Yes, that that was when she was twenty one, um, and. What's, but what's fascinating is that their relationship and it, and it continues literally to the end right. uh, to the end of, of her life because um, over time, I mean he Churchill changes his as he did on many things, he changes his position, um, then they find his party a, <laughs> he changes his party. Uh, they, they so but they find they find common cause having been, at loggerheads, and unfortunately, disastrously, when when Churchill won 
um, you know, Epping, he he Woodford and Epping, he discovered that Sylvia Pankhurst was uh, now his a constituent, uh, his <laughs> constituent, and and mailbags full followed, and of course there was there was a great deal of a very serious contestation. Uh, over the question of Mussolini and anti-fascism and Ethiopia. Uh, Sylvia was constantly urging Churchill, please to pay attention to this. Um, but over time, that shifted again because they did ultimately find common cause in, a long, in long political lives that intersected uh, very directly uh, over, over Nazism, fascism and the, sec the Second World War specifically. And even towards the latter period of, of when matters were finally, for want of a, for a shorthand, uh, were, were more resolved over, uh, over Ethiopia, you do actually even get to a point where that, uh, that Churchill, who the day after having literally yanked Sylvia's arm on the stage behind her, be behind her and yanked her down in a chair and then had his folks take her off the stage and, and lock her up in a room, uh, and then the next day saying of the women's vote, I will not be heckled into a question of, of, such, of henpecked. I will henpecked. not be henpecked into a question of such importance, very misogynistic phrase. But, um, you know, they're, they're, but latterly in the career, mm. there are, there's, there's re respectful correspondence. And he actually writes a very uh, considered or dictates from his office a very considered letter, uh, which, which responds and, and, and adumbrates her, the accuracy of her resistance to fascism. You also mentioned Lenin. Lenin, they, yes. They meet later. Uh, she's, she's the first to publish Lenin's uh, journalism and work uh, in in her newspapers in what was the women's dreadnought initially and then the workers dreadnought she goes to Moscow uh, to, to to the Moscow Congress in 1920 uh, she's she's there as a um, as, as one of the British delegates uh, but uh, ostensibly it is also to to, to resolve a fight that, that she had a, 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 dis a disagreement that she has with Lenin and it's it, that side of Sylvia is very interesting as well because she was a great traveller. It's something that um, mm. is not often thought about her, and I, she, you could, she's a really interesting travel writer and a very intrepid traveller. And she has to travel by a clandestine route to Moscow because she doesn't have a passport. She's not allowed to leave Britain, uh, and so she has to go a very, very circuitous route uh, on 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 ropey boats and and you know trains catching fire and so on and then Haile Selassie you mentioned of course indexes her long relationship to the anti-fascist and anti-racist struggle she knew him from the early days in London uh, and indeed towards the end of her life of course she was living in Ethiopia but that was a, a friendship and a political relationship which stretched across many decades and also men, and, and th these are the great political figures but also men of letters Bernard Shaw Oh, Bernard Shaw, Israel Zangwill, yep. um, and, and so on. And of course, these, you know, we're talking about the male figures, but equally mm. in an international context, the the women figures, naturally, all the, the great British, uh, you know, feminist suffragettes, and, and, and also, most importantly, the women that she, you know, that she worked with and alongside, whether, you know, in the suffragette movement, in the East London Federation, of suffragettes once she moved to, to East London definitively. But I think the other thing that's really striking about Sylvia in terms of her internationalism is how strong her international feminist network was. So she went on fascinating tours of, of Norway and Sweden um, that, that, she, uh, that she wrote about extensively and met leading feminists. In, and even in, you know at that time, Scandinavia was seen as very sort of cutting edge and advanced in terms of feminism and she she you know, she wrote extensively about that but she also traveled in America where she met all the and, and worked with a lot of the leading feminists across the political spectrum and of course she knew Clara Zetkin and she she published the works of Rosa Luxemburg and so she knew a lot knew and worked a lot with the European women feminists and and anti-war campaigners and, and pacifists so i think it's really important to remember that 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 context as well that it that that there were it was very it was very international in reach that and, network that she and formed for a, for a woman of her of her time and her background so 
ahead of her time on race. Extraordinary, really. I, mean, I, I think, um, again, a, another enormous fan of, uh, of, of your book. Um, um, uh, the, the, our great British Ethiopian uh, poet. Lem Sisse. Lem wrote, Sisse uh, yeah. um, wrote again so fondly of the book and said that she was protesting that Black Lives Matter before the term was invented. And I think anyone who reads the book will will see will see the force of see the force of that. Um, someone already has, has has suggested one of our one of our um, audience on this on this call has asked about how she ended up in in Ethiopia and the relationship with Haile Selassie. No, it's a, that's a, it's a it's a terrific um, question. So so thank you for that. And uh, that that's the thing about Sylvia, isn't it? She's a she's a teenage militant suffragette. Um, when you've got this new young generation of women, and of course, this is what this is what Emily Pankhurst and and, and her, the other mothers recognised that this was a new generation of, who who were going to push in a different way, and that was incredibly important part of her career. But it, it's really important to remember that in, that in terms of uh, anti-racism and anti-colonialism uh, and supporting those liberation struggles, but Ethiopia in particular. I mean, that was th thirty years consistently of her life, and she originally became involved. Uh, in in Ethiopia specifically because of Mussolini's imperial right. racist uh, uh, right. you know intentions there. but it's important I think also to put it just to, to put it in context that ahead of her time or in her time because of course she's from Manchester she's born in eight, in 1880s Manchester to a radical family and the connections between Manchester in particular, of course, other parts of the country, but Manchester, particularly in Liverpool and the abolitionist movement uh, were, were, were very, very strong. And so there were American abolitionists who would, would come and stay uh, indeed right. in the Pankhurst home and who would, you know, black abolitionists who would speak on behalf of women's rights in Britain. And there were reciprocities there. So I think it's really important to remember that the 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 anti-racist movement was embedded in that tradition and right. so, so these it, people who think that black lives matter is a flash in the pan or whatever need to need to see the through line that goes right back it's to... a movement of 600 years not a moment yeah. yes um and um <laughs> by the way to those people who are engaging from all over the place um um, we're now beginning to collect comments and questions, and my favourite, of course, which is a, which is a comment thinly veiled as a question. Mm. So you put your point and then say, yeah. "Don't you think?" And you can do that. You can do that in writing just as much as you could, you could have done it standing up at, at, at the British Library. So do please begin to to feed in your questions because we've just got about another twenty five minutes mm. together. But um, I'm very interested in her physical courage that goes with the moral courage. We, we, we often consider great political <laughs> figures and activist figures to have moral courage, but, but this woman, you know, is imprisoned a great many times and is, and is tortured um, at, at one stage more than any other suffragette because force feeding is torture, right? State-sanctioned torture in North state sanctioned yes. by charming liberal Tory governments well it was liberals um, at that time yeah not not so, not so long ago in 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 mm. in this country and she and she endures all of that and and goes on to still live really to be quite a grand old lady and outlives a lot of her 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 friends and comrades who um you know who who, who fall along the way with with all that danger and, and ill health and ill treatment I think that um, that that's true, and I I I think I say somewhere in the the book that I, one of the most frightening things about Sylvia is her fearlessness. Put in context, and as and, and as you say that 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 other people go a long way. It's 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 really important to remember how much suffering there was, and and uh, a lot. Um, uh, I mean, there was. We spoke at the beginning about the sacrifices. I mean, the, the, in the context of unfinished business, the, the exhibition, the sacrifices that women, um, and indeed many men, uh, who were also imprisoned, 
um, made to, uh, you know, for, for rights, rights for all for, and, and for women's rights as well as for men's rights. And in that context, there were many very, very brave and resilient women of all classes, actually. Um, obviously, the brunt of it fell on those who were, you know, were were, were less pr protected, uh, who were poorer, who had, you know, working class women did get the brunt of it. But it shouldn't be forgotten that, that in particularly in terms of the prison population of suffragettes, women all, women of all classes bonded. And, indeed and I think you I think you say at some point bonded over that. Yeah, you say at some point on the book, it's not dissimilar to the to the cross class experience that the men have in the trenches. Oh, it's exactly the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same, and it breaks down that that for as many. And I think it's important to remember that because because there's such a class split, which has such a long term effect, um, more because of the war on the feminist movement at that point. I think it's really really important to remember that that many women and you know aristocrats middle class women working class women wrote about how they came into contact with each other in prison and it broke down uh, those barriers and and people became equals and humans to each other but in, mm -hmm. so so there was suffering across the board and also in Sylvia's own in the Pankhurst family I mean her aunt Mary died dis horribly of a, of, a, of a brain hemorrhage literally uh, on Christmas Eve Christmas day I think it was after Christmas dinner um, after she just cut, she'd come out and served another prison term. We know some of the the, the other more famous examples, but it, it's really important to remember that both in terms of the injury and abuse that was dished out on the streets, whether it was by agent provocateurs, whether it was uh, by the police, um, that a physical attack, physical assault, in you know, in terms of those contexts happened, but it did. Uh, also the the suffering and damage that was caused by what was was uh, experienced mm. in uh, in 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 prison had an effect and indeed Zeely Emerson the American uh, feminist who co-founded the East London Federation of Suffragettes along with women east of East London and others with Sylvia um, uh, she um, had a, a terrible brain fracture uh, as a consequence of some, some of a run-in with um, some police and eventually actually had to go back to America as a, as a consequence. Do you know, Rachel, I was just thinking, you know, it, it's easy to sort of, um, you know, to get quite grim about, you had to write about some very, very grim things in this book, as well as wonderful travel and panoramas and, and, and colourful history and so on. And it's quite a hard balance to strike, isn't it? Getting all the history right, uh, covering the great span of the great life, but also revealing the personality and the and the intimate life and the psychological life, um, holding that all together in um, in one. But for example, I, I I love the way, and I know that one of your reviewers remarked on this too. I love the way that you deal with things as simple as food. Um, we 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 are animals. She hated you, porridge. She hated porridge. Poor thing. What an irony! What a bitter, unfair mm. irony! She hated porridge as a child, and and then had that horrific treatment. But also, food is, is a very interesting feature. Um, both, you know, the lovely hosp hospitality that she and Silvio gave to people, but also her rather sort of doer existence, as a, you know, by necessity, but, but also perhaps partly, you know, oh. as an art student and, and, and so on. What kind of well, person was she? <laughs> well, I'm going to answer the I'm going to answer the food question um, or, 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 or respond to that. Yeah, I, I mean, she was she was mostly a vegetarian, uh, except during wars. And of course, she 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 lives through several significant wars and of course she lived through the first world war and the second world war and, and so when you know when you could only eat what you could get then mm. then she would stand down on that um but um she was vegetarian famously annie kenny um wonderful wonderful uh, militant suffragette leader um and you know working class by origin irish and she was just like horrified she when she and sylvia were having to live together in sylvia's you know art artist's garret as you as you said in london and she, 
Annie Kenny wrote about Sylvia's sort of watery Egyptian lentils and her cocoa and the fact that everything was unseasoned. And every now and again, Annie Annie used to say, "Can we not go along to the to the Lions Restaurant, perhaps on the Strand, and just you know have a yeah. have a have a little dinner?" Um, but <clears throat> No, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of politics of food generally. It's actually quite important. I mean, there, there's a, there's a serious yeah. side to it as well because there are a lot of feminists historically, um, as as indeed in other uh, um, social democratic and indeed socialist traditions, who drawn links between you know the abuse of animals and and the abuse of of of, of women or, or or people in general. She did have this particular aversion to porridge, and it. And if, if you spend time as a biographer must in you know indeed living living with her for many years, this this does become a motif. And when she was a child, she would refuse to eat it and be tied to her bedpost, very Victorian punishment. Um, and she she absolutely refused it. And there's a there's a there's an interesting comment that Emmeline, her mother, makes, and Sylvia overhears her making it. Uh, to some friends and she said well I, I gave up punishing trying to punish Sylvia some years ago because I realized that she would literally die before she would give in mm. so I'm you know I'm and I thought yeah well wise that's woman some, wise, wise woman. woman so some insight into her daughter so but, I have um, a, I have I have a question here um sorry to interrupt from um from from one of our number who um who says that you talk in the book about um, an incident that connects your current subject with your last one, Eleanor Marks. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that, about that political relationship and also that incident, Eleanor Marks and Sylvia Pankhurst, the torch handed on? Well, that's a, that's a, a, a lovely, um, generous and, and, and warm question. And I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that because uh, it speaks very much to the occasion of me realising there's that there's that moment for a biographer when when the person always someone known to you uh, who's been there in one way or another but suddenly steps forward from a chorus if you like and, and comes into sharp focus and that was exactly what what happened to me I think it's something that um, B- Virginia Woolf referred to as the the fertile fact there's just this kind of sense that it has an aura about it Eleanor Marks who at, who at the time this event happened was a was a seasoned activist trade union leader you know known to be a supporter of of you know rights for women the emerging independent labor party she was called old stoker and the young sylvia pankhurst was taken to the mosley hotel in manchester and she was just 12 going on 13 at the time i think she was just about to turn 13 and her father richard pankhurst of course uh, took Pankersky, the Red Doctor, took his his middle daughter Sylvia to this meeting where Eleanor Marx was speaking, and it was a it was a meeting in honor of Karl Liebknecht, the leader of the the German SPD. And there is Sylvia re- remembers this episode. She recounts it in her first in her memoir, which is the memoir because she writes sequential memoirs of different periods of her life. The first one is about the suffragette movement. Then she writes The Home Front, which is about the war. Then she writes In the Red Twilight, which is the the rise of fascism uh, and and, and, and the ascent of Nazism. And these cover those those various different periods. And her, so you have this this, uh, recollection from Sylvia from her from her almost not a phrase that would have used in the days but we would say almost teenage eyes looking up and listening to this very impressive older uh, feminist leader but and and but what i found also very striking if i if i may about that moment um, is also that you get you really get the sense that the political baton is being the torch is, yep. is being handed on the feminist torch it's the legacy it's the through line it's the necessity of remembering where these things come from uh, the trade union leader the socialist but who will not absolutely says that women must be front and center of that uh, as Eleanor Marx insisted but at the same time Sylvia remarks and it's tricky to know because it's her she's she's sort of you know she's older when she's writing this she's 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 mm. sort of part, yeah, so how much is retrospective, but she remembers that that Eleanor's partner, Edward Aveling, was also at the meeting and she doesn't have a very favorable recollection of him. And what I find really interesting about that is mm. that she that Sylvia, who was was 
very successful in her relationships in 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 some ways but she didn't let them hamper her she didn't let any man hold her back and when she couldn't get what she wanted from Keir Hardy although she absolutely loved him and and it was a love relationship she was the one who knew that she had to move on and because she couldn't get what she she would never get what she needed likewise her 30 year relationship three decade relationship with Silvio Corio how she structured that she was immensely successful uh, in that context in in ways that that Eleanor Marx was not and was hampered well I don't, want, I, I don't that... want to give anything away about Eleanor Marx because I do recommend that people that people I read think people that. heard the bad news yeah yeah <laughs> boo hiss Edward Aveling I've a few questioners have um, have asked a bit more about the Ethiopian period and uh, and Sylvia and Selassie. And, and one in particular says, do you know if she had any views on Rastafarianism? <laughs> well, that's a terrific question. And yeah, well, Sylvia had views on everything. Um, and uh, the there's a there's a wonderful account, uh, and, uh, which I put in the book, when she first meets, uh, her first interview with Selassie, uh, when he's come, he's in exile in London, and she's already been writing and supporting and, uh, you know, campaigning in the newspapers and the press, lobbying government in England. And so immediately, a, a, you know, an, a, an arrangement is made for them to meet. She was actually at the train station uh, when he arrived, but that was just, you know, in fact, with a rolled up a copy of her newspaper, but uh, that was just the welcoming committee. But she meets him for an interview and she very briskly says to him, um, I, su I support your cause. I support your just cause against racism and imperialism and fascism and Mussolini. I don't support you because you are an unelected monarch on an ancient throne. And he says, and, 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 and Haile Selassie says, yes, I, I understand that very well. And I think that and that that moment sort of um, uh, will it explains to you the context in which she she enters into that uh, to answer the question of how she ends up ultimately in Ethiopia. Most of her fight on, uh, uh, in that context, uh, it still takes place uh, from London. And in fact, it's very um, it's very fascinating and interesting to see how her. Uh, her home in Woodford, uh, it, it actually becomes known as the, um, I think it was Kwame Nkrumah, um, her, the young Kwame Nkrumah who called it the village uh, because there were many young African leaders who were young exiles, students, yeah. dissidents, and they congregated their passing through as indeed many did refugees during the Second World War. So that it's important to remember that that diaspora, if you want to call it that, that political diaspora actually started in, in London. And then when people you know, went back and, and started continuing liberation campaigns in country, then that, then that dissipated. Sylvia had a long standing invitation from, from Selassie to go and live in Ethiopia. And it was towards, it was later in her life after Silvio had died. And, uh, and, and, and Selassie sent word and said, you know, why don't, why don't you come now? You know, there's, um, we, can, we can arrange a home for you, bring your son Richard uh, and carry on your work here. And that's what she did. And mm -hmm. she, she, I think there was some idea that she might slow down. In fact, she didn't. She coped with the altitude. She took a new box of paints and paintbrushes with her. I was informed by Rita Pankhurst, her, her marvellous and amazing, incredible daughter-in-law, uh, before she died that unfortunately that paint box remained untouched but Sylvia was incredibly busy and organizing and of course and you um, went didn't you you went to the hospital so I'm sorry you went of course for this for this book you went to Ethiopia and you saw how venerated um this woman who ought to be a British national treasure is in, in Ethiopia you write in your you write in your book about the Sylvia Pankhurst Cafe on Sylvia Pankhurst Street, and and I, I don't want to give too too much away, but there is a little reading this this wonderful book, Rachel. Um, it, it's a revelation, this, you know, this great British woman who some of us thought we knew a bit, but we didn't, certainly didn't know enough, and she's not properly valued in Britain in the way that she is elsewhere in the world, and in the way so many of her male contemporaries are valued. 
Well, there's a, there's an important link between the work in Ethiopia where she, when she dies, she has a state, she's given a state funeral. So as you say, during her lifetime, there's Sylvia Pankhurst Street, which is still there uh, in, in, in central Addis. Uh, and there's still, the, there's still the Sylvia Pankhurst Cafe with her name beautifully written uh, in, 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 in sign lettering in, in um, Harik, of course. Uh, but, but one of the most important projects that she worked on there collectively uh, with, with, with other Ethiopian women um, was, on, was on founding the first teaching hospital. Right for women and maternity hospital. And this links back uh, to, to a really important uh, aspect of Sylvia's career that, that we haven't touched on, but I'd just like to sort of, because it is very relevant to now. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the forces of, of darkness, the rise of the right, the need to be aware mm. of, of, of and vigilance about giving away rights and freedoms and, and trading off democracy. But the other aspect of Sylvia, which is really, really important is her interest in maternal, in maternal health and, and hospitals. And in fact, she writes um, a blueprint. She, I mean, she draws up a blueprint and writes a book called Save the Mothers. Uh, and it's it's a it's a plea for the construction of something that didn't exist at the time, which was a state funded national maternity health service. Mm. And later on, when you uh, flat, you know, you move forward, uh, those those ideas, that work that she did and her blueprint for the 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 national maternity health and allied medical services obviously focused on women and children and, 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 and on saving and improving the lives of mothers and, and their children childbirth was, was something that was built into those designs for the, for the National Health Service when it was constructed after the war. So there is a through line in, in, in her interest in, in maternity politics and, and public health, which I think is really important and for obvious reasons relevant to us to the present day. And you won't be surprised to know that, 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 that a number of people have, have shown an interest in the process of writing the book about, about this life. And, and I myself have been thinking that, you know, I mentioned your, your previous three biographies, James Barry, Sarah Bartman and Eleanor Marks. They're very much um, people of the Victorian age and, and Sylvia feels so 20th century. I mean, she dies in 1960 with Elvis Presley topping the hit parade. And that is that is quite something. And of course, that means you've got lots of photographic material, uh, let alone all the all the published material to um, to work with. But um, what was that a very different challenge to the previous works? Was that yes, it was. easier? It was. And, and, and that's something so because she is, as you say, she, she felt like that to me. She feels very modern and in many ways modernist. Uh, she's born into very much into the Victorian, the late Victorian mm. era, very radical time, but Victorian nevertheless. And, and in fact, uh, I, when Victoria died um, at the beginning of the 20th century, I did have to lie down um, <laughs> you know, in, in a darkened room and have a cup of tea because I, I, I'd never been li I'd never been working. Never lived without, and, never worked without Victoria. I, I never worked without Victoria on the throne. Um, and, and that transition is, but what, one of the things that's so fascinating about Sylvia is how she tracks those changes and is part of that, that modernity herself. And indeed, if you think about all the technological changes that happen, I mean, we, the, the, the questions about Ethiopia, I mean, she, the first time that she goes on a, a plane, uh, to, it, it is to, to Ethiopia. And she's, um, she's, you know, she, she's in her 60s, early 60s, and she's just completely um, captivated by the experience I mean, she fl and she flies from you know she flies from London and she she goes to she goes to Eritrea she goes to Elsmara and then she flies into to Addis Ababa and she describes what it's like to to see you know to see the land below but the other changes in technology and and actually for the suffragettes themselves I mean there was a particular moment where something goes wrong in a campaign going back to the suffragette era and and Emily, there's a remark that, that Emily uh, picked up, you know, went and found a telephone to call someone uh, to to get uh, actually, you know, a, a friend who was a, a woman to lobby her husband who was in Parliament. You, you see the, the technology coming. And of course, t uh, radio comes in uh, Sylvia's 
era and in fact we have a, a wonderful BBC uh, recording of her voice and in fact somewhat touchingly it's a piece that she did about uh, in 1956 I think it was um, about her mother and it's quite interesting how she she does this piece on her mother and, and, and she's an hour and older woman and she can see how she's become reconciled because she all that other stuff is is left behind and she now wants to mm. deliver very much this sort of figure you know respectfully and then television and in fact going back to Ethiopia again at a time where where people like um you know Evelyn War are, are saying that there's, there's no civilization and these people are, are basically you know barbarian I mean awful racist stuff Sylvia does this tv program the BBC program uh, where she talks about Ethiopian art and culture. She wrote a great big book on the history of history of Ethiopian art. And she lays out these objects. So she's very, she's very game to sort of adapt to new technologies. But yes, it did certainly mean that in terms of um, photography, there's there's a there's a great deal more to be to be working with. And indeed in terms of the her voluminous production of of newspapers and, and her, her use of the press. What she would have done with the internet and email oh, and social media. Goodness me. Oh, she wore out pen nibs as it was. So yeah, we, perhaps we were spared that. But what, what an extraordinary legacy. And, and, and even in this short hour that we've spent together, so much for, for any feminist or socialist or anti-racist or progressive campaigner of any kind to to learn from and uh, and be inspired by i i just hope that people make sure they get hold of um sylvia pankhurst natural born rebel by any means necessary as as, as soon as possible and um and certainly also give copies as, as christmas presents and, and and don't forget also that bloomsbury um now have um, the, the, the other books too, James Barry, Sarah Bartman, and of course, Eleanor Marks, um, A Life, uh, all available um, for, for, for a good reads for this very difficult season. And, and who knows what to follow. It remains for me to, um, to thank you, Rachel, for the, you, for the book. Me. But also, for, you know, it's not so easy to, to write a great big book and then, to, and then to have to talk about it as well. You know, those two skills don't always live so easily in the same house as they do with you. So thank you so much. And, and thanks, of course, to the British Library for, for bringing us all together and to, to their partners in, in libraries all, all, all over the place. Um, and to, to everyone who joined us, including via the Living uh, knowledge network um, unfinished business remains unfinished but, but, but hopefully hugely um, inspired um, by Sylvia Pankhurst and um, and just thank you everybody for for being here and, and sharing this evening um, and, and please and please keep reading and and stay safe